Hello friends, and welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. With Tears of the Kingdom's dungeons wrapped up, we're now returning to the 2D side of the Zelda series with a trip to Koholint Island, the setting of Link's Awakening. But before we get into the actual first dungeon, there's a few things I'd like to discuss. First of all, for this series, I'll be playing both the Switch remake of Link's Awakening as well as the GBA enhanced Link's Awakening DX via NSO. This game has had numerous releases, but if you were to visit the game for the first time today, these are the two versions I would recommend jumping into for the best experiences. Plus, just as we had done with Majora's Mask back in the day, I wanted to make some notes and compare version differences. While the Switch remake is mostly faithful to the original in terms of tile set placements and map designs, the art style is completely overhauled, leading to a distinctly different tone. Couple that with the numerous quality of life improvements, and each version has some pros and cons to weigh out. I think that DX has a darker tone, which jives with me, but the music of the remake is downright gorgeous. And I won't lie, the biggest advantage that the remake has is its controls. See, Link's Awakening was a Game Boy game, so it had all of two face buttons to work with, but paired with all of the ambition of what the Zelda team found themselves capable of making with games like A Link to the Past. So there's some major compromises made in terms of item management and controls. The Switch, simply by virtue of having more buttons and using them all, corrects this issue, which is frankly my biggest complaint with the Game Boy versions of the game. So there's some trade-offs, but either version is worthwhile if you've never had the chance to play Link's Awakening before. It is a very special game. Alright, with all of that said, we should get into talking about the actual game itself. So let's talk about the beginning of Link's Awakening. Shipwrecked in a storm, Link is found on the beach by Marin. After our hero awakens and gets his shield, we can take the south path down to the beach where she found us. At the shore, we'll find our sword. And it's then that a mysterious owl will tell us that in order to leave the island, we must awaken the windfish and to head north into the forest. At this point, of course, we don't actually know what a windfish is, but we'll find out. With our sword in hand, we can cut these plants blocking our way and head north. Classic Zelda item gating. Good stuff. In the mysterious forest, we'll get trolled by this raccoon, so avoid him. Instead, we'll find a mushroom, which we can take to the witch's hut and exchange for magic powder. We can then use this magic powder on said raccoon. Turns out it was Terran, Marin's father, who was magically transformed after eating some toadstools. Don't eat funny mushrooms you find in the woods, kids. With that done, we'll find the Tail Key, which opens the entrance to Tail Cave, the first dungeon. Good stuff. Before we head inside, a few notes to discuss about the game's brief opening sequence. First of all, this was, of course, just a summary of the mandatory stuff, but in reality, there's an entire village to explore here if you feel so inclined, including a shop, several houses, and a couple of fun minigames. It's great that the game lets you have so much space right at the start, but not too much that you can't get the lay of the land. The amount of stuff is even further expanded in the Switch remake. If you know where to look, you're able to assemble an entire heart container and go into the first dungeon with four hearts instead of three. There's a lengthy trading sequence that can be started here as well, which you'll probably be drawn to right away since the first item is a Yoshi doll. I mean, 
who wouldn't want a Yoshi doll. Overall though, this intro sequence does a great job of easing you into the game's core ideas. A straightforward linear path that teaches you how to block and avoid enemies, a return trip with your sword allowing you to defeat those enemies, a subtle lesson on items being able to open new paths that you may have already passed by, rewards such as heart pieces for exploring thoroughly, and a somewhat labyrinthian area in the woods, which requires you to find key items with some slightly harder enemies thrown in the mix. All classic Zelda stuff, taught to us gracefully in only a few minutes. There aren't a lot of version differences to go over here, aside from the remake having a seamless scrolling viewpoint, instead of screen transitions like the original. And that tone feels a bit different. I do appreciate the more detailed world map of the remake as well, and the ability to leave map markers. The original's map, by necessity, is rather abstract in comparison. It does the job well enough, but it lacks a lot of the details that the remake has, and if you're not as good at drawing a mental map of the area, then places like these woods are going to feel a bit more winding and confusing. Something introduced to us here as well is the game's overall progression structure, in which simply finding the dungeon entrance is not good enough. There will be objectives to complete in the overworld in order to get the dungeon-specific key and unlock access to those dungeons. A Link to the Past sometimes played around with this idea, but more often than not, if you could reach a dungeon, then you could do it. Here, the dungeon order is pretty rigid, and you absolutely have to progress the story between dungeons. But that's a good thing. There's a lot of little character moments we get to see that the first three Zelda games didn't have. Otherwise, there's not much else to discuss here, but I do appreciate how well this intro teaches us this stuff without being super intrusive about it. It's a very concise introduction overall. Alright, with all of that done, we can use the tail key to open this gate and head into the dungeon. Welcome to Tail Cave, a competent first dungeon. Why is it called Tail Cave? Uh, I'm not totally sure, but after a glance at the dungeon map, my suspicion is that the dungeon is modeled after its boss, Moldorm, who himself is about 70% tail. The dungeon also has mini Moldorms, who in Japanese are simply called tails, so that's probably the reason. Tail Cave is a cave with tails in it, and it looks like a tail. A neat bit of foreshadowing is that the tail key and the statues outside of the dungeon are depictions of Moldorm as well. This game plays around with the idea of shaping its dungeon layouts after specific items or creatures, which is a neat concept, but at times can hold back the level design. More often than not though, it isn't an issue, and Tail Cave is among those exceptions. While not particularly difficult for a seasoned Zelda player, let's remember that it's the beginning of the game still. However, the vibe here is spot on. We've got a cavernous aesthetic with lots of pitfalls, traps, and enemies who are more numerous and aggressive compared to those that we encountered outside. It isn't a hard dungeon, but it feels dangerous and tense, though I would have liked for its architecture, or lack thereof, to feel a bit more visually distinct. Oddly enough, this is less of an issue in the original, but in the remake the wall textures are identical to that of normal caves, aside from the coloration. The original instead gave us wafer cookie walls, which aren't super interesting to look at, but they're distinct enough, and honestly, does anybody other than me spend a lot of time looking at dungeon wall textures? Probably not, right? I do find the choices of color palette to be pretty interesting though. In either case, the walls have a red hue to them, but the DX version opts for gray and blue accents on blocks and doors, as well as the flagstone floor itself. Meanwhile, the Switch remake leans more into that stony cave aesthetic with brown, solid stone floors instead of the flagstone from 
from the original. This means that cracked floors stand out more in the remake, and actually look a little out of place, almost like they're reimagined as specifically designated traps rather than unstable parts of the floor. All this is not to knock on the remake, I just find the different interpretations to be interesting. In fact, I'd argue that while it works on the Game Boy Color, the blue floor would look pretty out of place in the remake's art style. Plus, the Switch remake's added details to a lot of these textures is really nice. They add a lot of flourish to highlight areas of importance while still adhering to the original intentions behind those designs, and the dungeon's dangerous vibe. That feeling is aided by the music. Something I want to note here actually is that Link's Awakening was the first Zelda game that gave us dungeon-specific music. Zelda 1 and 2 and A Link to the Past had a total of two dungeon themes each. The NES titles both had their dungeon themes shared among all of their respective dungeons with the exception of the final dungeon, while A Link to the Past made the distinction with its music between light and dark world dungeons. It is interesting then that Link's Awakening, a game made for technically inferior hardware, made the choice to give every dungeon unique music. A choice that is very welcome. The original version of the song is pretty good honestly, given what the Game Boy was capable of. It shifts between curious and tense really nicely, which is perfect for a Zelda dungeon, which tend to blend combat and puzzles. The remake does a wonderful job translating the chiptunes to actual instruments. It nails the intended feeling of the track nearly perfectly. The only part I'd say the original does better is the feeling of unease in this particular section. Which by comparison feels a bit downplayed in the Switch version. But regardless, it still is a great piece of dungeon music, even if it feels thematically pretty similar to the usual cave theme. As for the dungeon progression, I feel it strikes a pretty great balance of exploration, combat, and puzzles. Immediately in the first room, we've got a fork in the road, requiring us to explore both paths. If you get too far exploring straight forward without going left first, then you're going to find yourself short a key, and without the compass. That said, finding the compass before the map always feels weird and illegal to me, but I do like the added feature of the compass sounding off a little jingle when you're in a room with a treasure chest that you haven't found yet. Plus, this was the first Zelda game where the compass marks the locations of treasure chests on the map, a series staple going forward. Prior games only had it reveal the boss location. This certainly makes the compass more useful, and given that there's no minimap, the audio indicator goes a long way to making sure that you don't miss things. Taking the northern route offers a second split in the road, but either direction will take us to the dungeon's large central room. The right path has the dungeon map as well as a one-way door that drops us into said central room, while the left path has a room with keys, but access isn't one directional. So you can use this route to backtrack if you missed stuff. In the central room, we have a few more options as to where to go next. The path northwest is where we'll find the dungeon item, the excellent Rock's Feather, which is so useful that it's going to be permanently mapped to my X button during the rest of this playthrough. The path northeast loops us up to this ledge to get the boss key, and the path straight east will eventually lead us towards the boss fight itself, barring a small detour. There is also a small hidden room to the west that is entirely inaccessible due to us not having bombs yet. And yes, it does bother me. 
something to highlight is the use cases for the dungeon item, the Rock's Feather. This is essentially a jump ability, which Link traditionally isn't able to do, but the dungeon, small as it is, gives us plenty of opportunity to use it. First, immediately after getting it, there are some recovery hearts floating in the air that we can hop up to grab. We also can hop over the gaps in the underground passage that we crossed through to get back the way we came, hop over this little gap to take a shortcut back through this room, and one more hop right here to avoid this blade trap safely. Yes, this little backtrack with shortcuts took you right through a dungeon item tutorial without you even realizing it. Additionally, those aforementioned routes from the central room to the east and northeast are only accessible after getting this item, reinforcing that ability gating concept I mentioned before the dungeon. We can go here earlier than this and see that there is a path to take, we just can't actually reach those areas until we have the item we need. So both the boss key and route towards the boss are dependent on us having the dungeon item first. That's good too, because this east path also takes us into the mid-boss fight, against the spike roller, which the dungeon item is essential for, since it allows you to jump over his rolling spike trap, and then attack him. He is not a hard mid-boss by any means. You can wail on him and take him down pretty quickly. But again, this is the first dungeon. I like that fighting him puts the item to use and makes jumping to avoid damage feel like a natural extension of Link's abilities. Also, a trend that starts in Link's Awakening and gets carried over to a lot of handheld titles is that defeating the mid-boss opens a portal that will warp you back to the start of the dungeon and back, serving as a handy shortcut if need be. This was probably done due to the fact that the game was originally designed with being a portable title in mind, so something like this could save you some valuable time if you're playing in short bursts and have to stop before you can finish the dungeon. Finally, there's one more optional detour to get some recovery hearts if need be, but otherwise at this point, we can confront the dungeon boss. Entering the boss room will immediately be confronted by Moldorm, making a return from A Link to the Past. In the DX version, he shares Link's color palette, so he's got this sleek green and black color scheme. The Switch remake updates him to more closely resemble the hungry burger worm monster from A Link to the Past and A Link Between Worlds. I'm fine with either design, though he does lose his mandibles in the adaptation, but I I like the consistency, since Link's Awakening is a sequel to A Link to the Past. Either way, Moldorm is a total pushover of a boss in this game. It doesn't even really feel like he's attacking you, he's more just zooming around the room, doing his own goofy little thing, so you can very easily avoid him and strike at his tail to take him down. I don't mind the lack of difficulty here, I'll keep tapping the sign, it's only the first dungeon, so Moldorm gets a pass from me. It is ultimately a retread of the battle from A Link to the Past, but despite the arena being so much smaller here compared to when we fought him at the Tower of Hera, the added mobility of having the Rock's Feather coupled with Moldorm's low health value makes this fight a whole lot easier than that one, especially in the Switch remake. In the original version, the chasm around the arena takes up these entire sections of the room, bracketing the arena. The remake adds in some cracked floor tiles. These will still break if stood upon for too long, but they offer a lot more grace and wiggle room to recover during the fight. Worth a mention here, I criticized Moldorm in A Link to the Past for not having any dungeon item integration. While that is true 
for this version of Moldorm as well, technically. I'm not inclined to dock at any points for that either, since the feather does improve our mobility, making the fight much easier. And the mid-boss was already clearly designed around using that item as well, so it still gets its chance to shine in a combat scenario. Overall though, Moldorm is a perfectly serviceable boss fight. It isn't bad per se, I just find it largely uninteresting. Either way, Moldorm should go down pretty quickly. I gotta appreciate the way he explodes in segments like this. It's a bit over the top, but very on brand for Zelda bosses. Once he's defeated, we'll get our heart container as usual. We'll find the full moon cello, the first dungeon MacGuffin. I mean, the first of eight instruments of the sirens needed to awaken the windfish. And we're off. Overall, Tail Cave works really well as a starter dungeon. I appreciate the multiple branching paths and different routes the dungeon allows for. While great in either version, one thing I think the remake does a little better is its seamless scrolling in larger rooms. The classic screen transitions are retained in dungeons when going through doors which cleanly divide rooms, but for those larger rooms, such as the central room, having the screen scroll smooth like this helps it not feel so disjointed. I am aware that this is a technical limitation of the Game Boy, but that doesn't mean I can't still appreciate the change in the remake. It makes this room feel more like one larger room while still being faithful to the dungeon's floor plan. It's a small but welcome update. I also like how it employs the old treasure chest tease, allowing you to see things you can't quite reach yet. That is until you have the required item. The dungeon is not perfect, however. The inclusion of a bombable wall here annoys me. We cannot get bombs yet, which means we'll have to revisit this dungeon later on in order to get a single treasure chest. It's optional, yes, but I'm a completionist even to my own detriment at times. I also am not fond of the placement of the stone beak. For context, each dungeon will have a series of owl statues that are missing the beak. We can find said beak hidden somewhere in each dungeon, which allows us to interact with the statues for some clues. That's usually fine, but in Tail Cave, the beak is placed on the eastern side of the dungeon, right before the mid-boss and subsequent dungeon boss, meaning that if you want to see those other owl statue interactions, you'll have to backtrack across a great deal of the dungeon. And honestly, the hints aren't usually that worthwhile. At least not the ones in this dungeon. I do, however, really like the aesthetic of this room and the matching puzzle with this three-of-a-kind enemy. The beak's placement is probably here for people who explored and got a little too off track, since this room, as deep into the dungeon as it is, is accessible pretty early on. So with that in mind, it's fairly excusable. Above all else, though, this dungeon does a fantastic job of teaching and reinforcing forcing a lot of concepts that are going to be critical to this game, such as having to explore multiple branching paths, the existence of underground passages to connect distant rooms within a dungeon, a returning concept from Zelda 1, and using your dungeon item to gain access to new areas. It shows with its multiple routes that sometimes there are different ways of reaching the same area, and how doors can be unlocked under different conditions, such as by finding keys, needing to defeat enemies, or solving puzzles. It also does the same for treasure chests and keys, showing different ways of gaining access to them, as well as the different sorts of things found within those chests, whether it be the map, compass, keys, or just cash. And it does all of this while rolling out a new roster of enemies that are greater in variety and challenge to those we fought outside before the dungeon. This stuff may all sound rudimentary, especially to those of us experienced players. But again, this is the game's first dungeon, and it may even be someone's first dungeon ever if they've never played another Zelda game before this. If that sounds silly, let's put this into perspective. As faithful and expertly modernized as the remake is, originally Link's Awakening was designed for the Game Boy. While yes, it is the fourth Zelda game, the NES, home of Zelda 1 and 2, saw 
lifetime sales of 61.9 million units. The Super Nintendo, which housed A Link to the Past, saw a lifetime sales of 49.1 million units. The Game Boy, however, exceeded more than both combined, with 118.7 million units. It is to date the fourth best selling game console ever. So when designing a Zelda title for that platform, it was almost certainly important for them to keep that barrier of entry in mind. There was likely to be a lot of new players who hadn't familiarized themselves with the tropes and standards that A Link to the Past had set precedent for. In simpler terms, it's more than likely that a lot of people experienced Link's Awakening as their first Zelda game. And when looking at the way this game handles its opening sequence, sequence and first dungeon, I can't help but feel that the devs anticipated as much. And that's great, it is good design that they can account for new players while still delivering a solid Zelda experience that seasoned players can get into without feeling like their hands are being so overtly held. That's a delicate balance, one that not every Zelda game manages to do, but Link's Awakening handles it just right. Thank you all so much for watching, and special thanks goes out to my channel members here on YouTube as well as my supporters on Patreon. You guys make this all possible. So thank you to Greymage, Brenda, Tetra, Justin, Midnight, Naomi, Bunny, Stefan, as well as all of the folks whose names you're seeing on screen right now. You guys are awesome. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye bye